Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's Cleveland Clinic London COVID-19 webinar, which will focus on optimizing individual and organizational health and safety during COVID-19. I'm Jim Gutierrez, an internal medicine physician, and I'm our Chief of Quality, Safety, and Patient Experience here at Cleveland Clinic London. Today, I'm webcasting from our offices at 40 Grosvenor Place, right next door to where our hospital construction is proceeding at full stream. We'll be opening our 184-bed surgical hospital on January 2022, and we'll be bringing Cleveland Clinic's tradition of safety, quality, and patient experience to London and to the United Kingdom. Well, we couldn't have foreseen when we planned this webinar uh, where we would actually be today in both the US and the UK with regards to COVID-19. The UK is in the midst of its second national lockdown to try to stem the rise in infections, while cases are rising in 46 of the 50 states in the United States. In both countries, hospitals and ICU capacity are significantly strained, with elective care and surgery increasingly being postponed to allow for a focus on patients with COVID-related illness. Today, we'll hear about how Cleveland Clinic has responded successfully to these challenges in Cleveland. At the same time, we've had some good news this week regarding the effectiveness of the first of what promises to be a number of COVID-19 vaccines. And as also we will hear today, there is hope of vaccination beginning before the end of this calendar year. Today, we're joined by three speakers who are not only outstanding clinicians in their own right, but also are leaders in their respective institutions, playing key roles in the COVID response. Our first speaker is Dr. Ian Cropley. Ian is a consultant in infectious diseases and HIV here in London at the Royal Free Hospital. He has a broad experience in the care of patients with infectious diseases, including HIV and tuberculosis. We're thrilled to have Ian join us on our Cleveland Clinic London team. And today, Ian will be giving an update on the current status and new developments in COVID in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief talk uh, about, about where we're up to in London, um, uh, which I hope uh, will really set the scene for, for where we are now. Um, just a word of caution, things are changing very rapidly here and there are lots of government announcements and drug announcements that are going on at the moment. And it's been quite difficult to write this talk because I've had to change it just about every day. Um, so thank you for joining uh, and uh, let's get underway with this. So the second wave and the second lockdown. So I'll talk to you a bit about what's happening in the UK and more specifically in London. Um, the epidemiology of the disease. I'll go through what therapeutics we have, uh, what vaccines we have. I'll talk a bit about mink uh, and the uh, SARS-CoV-2 that has um, uh, crossed from humans to mink and back again. Then I'll talk about our testing strategies, which are evolving daily in the UK. And just to mention long COVID at the end, which is a significant problem for a number of our patients. Next slide, please. Okay, so on the top graph, you can see the number, the daily number of cases positive in the whole of England. Um, the dotted line, the vertical dotted line is when we started widespread testing. So the numbers before that for the positive cases really just reflect the ones that were coming into hospital. And in fact, the peak, at the, the first peak, so um, in the, the beginning of April would have been 10, 20 times higher than that in reality. It's just that we were only able to test the ones that came in. But since then, we've been testing uh, much more widely. And you can see in England, there has been a sharp rise over the last six weeks uh, of cases in England, and it's still going up. On this graph, it looks like there might be some leveling off. I think we need to see whether that's a reality or not. Um, the, the numbers take a little while to, to come in. Uh, and we'll see what our seven day average is doing. The graph below shows you what's happening in London and you can see we're up to what, two and a half thousand positive cases per day in London. And so it's mirroring pretty much what's happening across England. Um, but we are 
in the moment in London being spared the worst. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So uh, the the top graph is is the new is the positive cases in London that I showed you before. The bottom graph is the total number of positive inpatients we've got in London. So you can see in our first peak we had five thousand patients in hospital across London uh, uh, at the peak. Um, we have a, about a thousand in hospital across London at the moment, of which about 200 are in intensive care beds. We have somewhere between 800 and 900 intensive care beds in London. So a substantial chunk of our intensive care beds are occupied, but we are a fifth of what we were in the peak. Um, you can see our rate of um, uh, increase of, of hospital cases is really slowly rising rather than the rapid rise where we were hit really badly first time round. And uh, I'm sure you all you all know you all realise just how hard it hit and how quickly things went uh, went from from nothing to being uh, really uh, unbelievably busy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so. This is now comparing the total number of positive inpatients in London. So this is the graph I've just shown you. And next slide. This compares with what's happening in the northwest of England, which um, has been really badly hit. And you can see that their second peak is as bad, if not worse, than the first peak. Uh, so in London, we're relatively spared. But in other parts of the country, particularly the northwest of England, so around Manchester, around Liverpool, it's really difficult. Um, there are the staff are really stretched there. Um, routine operations are being cancelled, uh, and things things are very very difficult. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So we're in lockdown 2.0, as it's referred to in the press, and this is a little bit more lax than first time. Uh, this came in a week ago today. Uh, before that, there were local lockdowns with different local rules, but the whole of England has gone into lockdown now. The other nations, so Scotland, Wales and uh, Northern Ireland, have uh, different rules at the moment. So I'm just talking about England here. So our rules are to work from home wherever possible. Our bars and restaurants are closed except for takeaways. Our non-essential shops are closed. Uh, and there's no social mixing between different families in the home or garden. We're allowed to meet one other person outside for exercise if we need to. If we need to work, we can come in. Transport is running. Transport, from my point of view, actually seems quite busy. It's much busier than it was in first lockdown when the trains were completely empty, whereas uh, now I don't necessarily get a seat every day. The big difference this time is that schools and universities have stayed open. So schools and universities weren't running uh, last time. But kids are going to school uh, really because of the, the, the effects of, uh, on their mental health and, uh, and their sociability. And universities re are remaining open. We think some of our increase in cases this year in, in this peak was driven by the start of the university term. Uh, in September, October, lots of kids getting together, so teenagers getting together and mixing. And a number of universities around the country have had huge outbreaks where just about every everybody has um, has caught the virus. And there's now um, decisions about what happens around Christmas and whether children are going to be allowed home, whether the teenagers are going to be allowed home for uh, for Christmas. Next slide, please. Okay, so a bit about treatment. I think it's fair to say there's been some progress. However, we don't have any wonder drugs and there are lots of trials ongoing still. So I'm not going to go through all of the drugs and all of the trials. There are hundreds in progress at the moment, but I'll go through places where I think there's been some progress. So next slide, please. Um, dexamethasone is the first one to mention. This is an easily available cheap steroid um, and it has been shown uh, in, the, in trials that for patients who need oxygen, so who need to come in, need oxygen by a, uh, an oxygen mask, so without going to intensive care unit and being ventilated, for every 100 patients we give dexamethasone to, we will save three lives and 23 will still have a fatal outcome. So as you can see, the fatality will go down from 26% to 23%, not a huge decrease, but it's a decrease and it gives us some hope that we can actually attack this disease, but it's not a wonder drug. Next slide, please. 
This shows you the effect of dexamethasone in patients who go to the intensive care unit and need ventilating. So these are the more seriously ill patients with more inflammatory response in their lungs, and they respond better. So dexamethasone is a much better drug for them. And so for every 100 patients that we treat with dexamethasone that go to the intensive care unit uh, and require ventilation, we save 12 lives, but 29 still have a fatal outcome. So the mortality goes down from 41% to 29%, which is a substantial drop in intensive care mortality. So this shows you where dexamethasone has its biggest place. It doesn't have an effect on people who are not ill enough to come into hospital. And we probably see more side effects from the dexamethasone. So probably does a bit more harm than good. So really, really, we reserve it for people who need oxygen. And uh, it's really important for people on intensive care unit who need mechanical ventilation. Next slide, please. Our next drug is remdesivir. And this is an antiviral agent. Um, there have been a couple of trials, well, there's been one trial um, published, the ACTT1 trial, and there's a lot of controversy about how good remdesivir is at the moment. This particular trial showed that it shortened hospitals in patients who did not seem to need to go to the intensive care unit. So patients who could be looked after on the ward with an oxygen mask. And it shortened their stay from 15 days in hospital to 10 days on average. And when you're strapped for beds, that's a really important uh, benefit that you get from, from that drug. However, there doesn't seem to be a mortality benefit. It didn't seem to benefit patients who went to intensive care unit. There's been another study published. Um, next slide, please. So when I say published, it's not properly been published. It's in preprint, which means it's not been peer reviewed. It's not been scrutinized externally yet. Um, but the numbers have been poured over by uh, by all of us. Uh, and we're waiting for the, the formal peer review and the formal publication. And this actually was very disappointing and didn't show a benefit in mortality or duration of stay or whether it stopped people going to the intensive care unit. So there's a bit of disagreement about uh, how good remdesivir is and what its place is. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and just to say that there's no benefit with these other drugs, hydroxychloroquine, lapinavir-ritonavir combination, which is an HIV drug, and interferon beta that were in the same trial. Uh, next slide. Um, but we were instructed at the end of last week by our chief medical officer that we should be giving remdesivir to all patients who are hospitalized, who require oxygen, including patients on the intensive care unit. So we presume some access to the numbers and some calculations have been done that we are not party to yet, uh, so long as it started within 10 days of the illness. Um, so some of us were debating whether remdesivir would be thrown out or whether it would be continued. And it seems that there is still enthusiasm to use remde remdesivir here. Next slide. Um, next, I'm going to talk about monoclonal antibodies. These are antibodies that are synthesized in the laboratory and they bind to the spike protein of the virus. And those are the red things sticking out of the virus on the top right. These are the uh, spike proteins that bind to the cell and allow the cell to gain entry. If you have an antibody sitting there in the way, it stops the virus getting into the cell and replicating. Um, next slide, please. Um, these, so at least two of the monoclonal antibodies have actually shown no benefit in hospitalized patients. Uh, and we think maybe this is because the active phase of viral replication is on the way out then anyway, and it's more of an inflammatory illness by the time the patients are admitted to hospital. So there's some interest in looking at whether monoclonal antibodies have a place in earlier treatment, so before people become ill enough to need to come to hospital. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in the States, on the 9th of November, which is not so long ago, the FDA licensed the emergency use for those who are unwell in the community at the very highest risk of progression to severe disease, so particularly the elderly or those with comorbidities. Um, it's an injection. It's an intravenous injection. It's expensive. It's really quite difficult to administer 
in an outpatient setting and make sure you target it to the right people. And it's costly. Um, so it's it's quite a difficult one to, to um, put into a, a programmatic treatment. However, next slide, please. The early data suggests that it reduces hospital attendance in this group of high-risk patients from 10% right down to 3%. Now, if this is borne out by the trial, so there are still plenty of trials ongoing uh, with this product, the Eli Lilly product and various other products. If this is borne out, this is really hopeful that actually having antibodies around at the start of the infection is going to be useful. Next slide, please. Okay, vaccines. There's been a lot of talk about vaccines at the moment. Again, all the vaccines are designed to generate an immune response to the spike proteins, so people will have the, the um, antibodies ready should the vaccine, should sorry, should the virus come along. Next slide, please. Um, there are four uh, basic sorts of vaccines. There's messenger RNA, which is the virus's equivalent of DNA, and what it uses to, um, to build the proteins to replicate. So the mRNA vaccine, um, the RNA that is injected in the vaccine is just there to generate a spike protein so that the person who's vaccinated will generate an antibody response to spike protein. There's nothing else of the virus in there apart from the coding for the spike protein. Next, please. Um, adenovirus, chimp adenovirus vector is another way of getting the, um, the, the genetic code for the spike protein into humans and this is again injected. The adenovirus is a common cold virus but it's a chimp common cold virus that is injected and um, allows production of spike protein uh, to prime the, the vaccinated. Next slide. Uh, recombinant spike protein on its own, so just injecting people with the preformed spike protein with various adjuvants to increase the immune response. There are various vaccines where that is being tried as well. And next. Uh, whole inactivated virus. So this is one of the oldest means of, of creating a vaccine. You just take the virus, you kill the virus, and then inject it and develop an immune response. Uh, and there are a number of vaccines um, in trials uh, that are um, that are produced in this way. So next slide, please. All of the interest at the moment is around the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine, which is mRNA, messenger RNA, injected in little uh, balls of fat in uh, um, in liposomes. Uh, it requires two. Uh, injections, so on day one and day 21. Uh, its big difficulty is that it needs to be stored at minus 80, which is uh, uh, a lot colder than a lot of laboratories have freezers for. It can be kept at warmer temperatures for um, a, a couple of days, but um, to transport it around, it needs to be at minus 80. Uh, the full data aren't available yet, and this is actually just a press release rather than releasing data. But as far as I understand it and others understand it, it seems that 30,000 people have taken part in the trial. Half of them have been vaccinated and half of them have received a placebo, so not a vaccine. They've had two doses, three weeks apart, and then they've been tested a week after their second vaccine. Uh, they've had a swab to see if they are virus positive or not. Um, so next slide, please. And this has shown that of the people who received the fake vaccine, so the, the false vaccine, the placebo, 86 of them were infected at day 28. But of the people who received the vaccine, only eight people were virus positive at day 28. And this is all the data that we have at the moment. We're waiting for more to be released by Pfizer. Um, so it's a short-lived response at the moment. We don't know whether it's sustained. We don't know the population that was recruited to the study. We don't know whether it will work in old people who are obviously the uh, most at risk group. Um, so there's a lot of questions about, uh, about this vaccine, but it is really interesting that the vaccine, vaccinated people have a tenth the rate of infection as the uh, people who received the placebo vaccine. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of excitement about that. Next slide, please. Uh, the UK are gearing up to be able to offer vaccination from December. So the means of delivering vaccine and plans for delivering vaccine are being put into place. But this will only happen if a vaccine, it might be the Pfizer vaccine, it might be another vaccine, are improved, are approved by our regulatory uh, agency, the MHRA, the equivalent of the FDA. Uh, and there would be a plan to roll out vaccination from December if the vaccine is approved, starting with all people in elderly care homes and their workers, their carers, and then roll down to the 80-year-old uh, age group, then to the 70-year-old age group, plus all healthcare workers, all frontline healthcare workers and social care workers, and then to the 60-year-olds and people with other comorbidities, um, down to the age of 50. There's no comment yet about whether people under the age of 50 will be offered vaccination, but they generally, people under the age of 50, are not a high-risk group. Um, this will divert a huge amount of resources. Um, the UK has bought 40,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which is, if everybody, if everybody needs two doses, which is enough to vaccinate 20, 20 million, sorry, 40 million doses, enough to vaccinate 20 million people. So this is a huge logistic undertaking, as you can imagine. And there's talk about converting stadia, warehouses, into this and then finding people to vaccinate. So diverting GP resources, general practitioner resources, just to vaccinating for the next few months to try and get through the population. Um, people in hospital, maybe even people like me on my day off, I might be asked to come and vaccinate a few people. Um, so it looks like there's planned to be a huge mobilization of resources for this. Next slide, please. Um, to mention mink in Denmark, you might have heard Denmark had huge mink farms, something like 17 million mink there in Jutland, which is the bit of Denmark that uh, that sticks up um, from uh, Schleswig-Holstein in, in Germany. Mink have acquired the COVID virus, SARS coronavirus, from humans. It's mutated in the mink and it's gone back into humans. Now, a very small number of the um, viruses that have gone back into humans have an altered spike protein. Next slide. Um, there's no sign that the disease is worse. It seems to be the same disease. Uh, next slide. But the worry is if the spike protein has mutated, has changed its shape, shape, the antibodies that we're using, the monoclonal antibodies and the antibody response from vaccination is just not going to work uh, or is not going to work as well. So next slide. The UK has stopped most travel from Denmark in the last week. Um, and if a person comes from Denmark and is identified as having COVID, then they are isolated in hospital and the virus is sequenced to see whether or not it is the mutant virus with the, the mutant spike protein. This is an attempt to stop the virus spreading widely in the community, but obviously it's difficult and you just wonder whether this sort of approach is going to be successful. But that's what we're doing at the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, testing has also taken off. There have been more announcements in the last couple of days. Mass community testing has started across England, starting in areas of high prevalence. A number of London boroughs are in the areas of high prevalence as well. So where I live, where this hospital is, there will be community testing. There'll be something like 10,000 tests delivered per week for the local borough to decide how the testing will be allocated. Next slide, please. And then the other thing that's just been announced is that all frontline healthcare workers are to test at home before coming into work twice a week and will use a lateral flow assay. So they'll take a nasal swab or a bit of saliva and we'll put it onto a stick very much like a pregnancy test. So there's a pregnancy test on the right and it comes up with a band. This is exactly the same sort of test that we will be asked to use twice a week before we 
come to work. And if it's positive, we stay home and we have a PCR test. So that's a big change. And obviously, this is going to be really difficult, a big challenge to implement logistically. But hopefully, it will protect our patients and it will stop the staff spreading it amongst themselves, which also is a, is a real problem. Next slide, please. Um, and a final word about post-COVID syndromes that our government has recently, uh, just in the last few days, published guidance on what to do for people who have long COVID, which is a real problem. I have colleagues who've been off work for months now, having caught COVID in the, uh, in the first wave. Uh, and we see patients who are really debilitated. And at the moment, we don't know what to do for them. We don't have a, an immediate remedy, but we need to provide lots of supportive care for them. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. And, That's my and thank you. Oh, sorry. And thank you very much. Boy, certainly lots going on with COVID right now. And like you said, I think that's changing by the minute. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Rita Pappas. Uh, Rita is a staff physician in the Department of Pediatric Hospital Medicine at Cleveland Clinic. She's also served in a variety of leadership roles uh, during her time at Cleveland Clinic. And I've had the pleasure of being able to collaborate with her on several projects. Rita currently serves as the Medical Director for Hospital Operations within the Division of Medical Operations at Cleveland Clinic. And during the pandemic, Rita was named the Chief Medical Officer of the Cleveland Clinic Hope Hospital, which as we'll hear was a thousand bed surge hospital built on the Cleveland Clinic campus as a response to the COVID pandemic. Welcome Rita and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jim. It's my pleasure to talk to all of you today. Um, next slide, please. So I, working on presenting to you just a short overview of our experience with the first wave and how we band together as an institution to care for potentially a surge of patients that we were expecting in Cleveland. Um, next slide. So I wanted just to provide you a timeline on what was happening in the US at the time that we were thinking about COVID. One of the things that really wanted to commend our leadership on is that we really started preparing for a potential surge back in January, went before there was just news breaks about the COVID um, infections. So we started in January 23rd with just trying to understand as much information as we could about the virus. And then our incident command or our emergency management team planned a tabletop exercise on how we would care for COVID patients. If you can recall, the issue was really around testing and um, Dr. Rubin will remember when we first released the order back March 6th on who we were gonna test and we actually aligned with the CDC criteria for testing. Shortly within that time frame, when we released the order, within three days, we had our first three cases of COVID in our um, Cuyahoga County or residents in, um, in Cleveland. And those cases were related to um, people who had traveled. And it was a husband and wife couple and then an additional um, individual. Rapidly, within the first five days, we opened a drive-through testing site, um, worked with our electronic medical record teams to create screening pools, created a wing within our one of our regional hospitals to actually cohort patients with COVID, um, and in response, created an employee hotline for our caregivers, um, really to just calm a lot of anxiety but also to be able to test our employees quickly when we needed to. Um, we were very short of personal protective equipment and started to work with our supply chain colleagues to try to gain as much PPE as possible. It was around that time on March 14th that our leaders looked at some modeling data and realized that if we expected a surge with the rate of rise that was happening, that we would not have enough 
beds to care for patients with COVID within Cleveland. So within that time frame, I was charged to actually open a thousand beds in less than three weeks. Um, and so our tentative date for opening the beds was um, April 16th. Next slide. So these are the keys to success that I wanted to share with all of you. Really an interprofessional team. So physicians, we are a physician led organization, but really could not have actually accomplished what we needed to do within three weeks without the collaboration of our nursing partners. Um, Shannon Pangle was labeled as the chief nursing officer. And then I had a chief operating officer, Robert Stahl, who's had many years of experience, both working um, internationally as well within the Cleveland system. The other piece that I really attribute our success to is teamwork. We were huddling twice a day, um, short one hour meetings on all of the tasks that we needed to accomplish within each lane, medical, nursing, as well as operations, seven days a week. Uh, in order to be innovative, but also efficient, we embedded a continuous improvement officer to help us learn how to take care of these patients. Um, and that was instrumental, and I think, um, really leaning on the Six Sigma principles. So not just replicating what we created in our hospital, um, Cleveland Clinic Hospital, it was their way to be more innovative in caring for COVID patients. And lastly, uh, what I think is probably the most important piece is inspiration. So getting all of our team members to rally around a cause. Um, next slide. So this is a, a cute picture, but what, what ended up happening was uh, the health education campus has the nomenclature of HEC. And so what we did as a leadership team was try to inspire all the people that were working to build this hospital um, within a short time frame. And so we came up, um, Dr. Samitha Khatri is the one who actually started saying that we needed to to actually build hope that this was not something that was scary this was a hopeful um message that we were sending that we were going to be able to care for patients and so then we started within our executive team calling it the hope hospital and then it spread and so you could see this was actually an um a bed planning person who told his daughter that he was building a hope hospital so she created this sign, which we posted on the first floor um, to motivate others to continue working um, collaboratively side by side. And next slide. This just shows you a, a large picture. The health education campus was is really just uh, Sorry, it has medical students, nursing students, um, dental students, and PA students. It was not meant to be a hospital. This is the first floor of the atrium. And you can see we built roughly on that first floor 327 beds. Um, can you go to the next slide? I'm just going to show you a quick time lapse video with Lauren's help. <laughs> So really moving everything out within the next 30 seconds, you'll see one of our major challenges was that we had to pipe oxygen through the building. So those barricades that you see that are standing there are actually, we did a quick data research to look at the 100 patients we had cared for in our system and realized that they needed at least the majority needed three liters of oxygen. So we worked with our Praxair consultant to build that grid um, within three weeks to be able to deliver the three liters of oxygen. Uh, next slide. So as I stated before, there were 327 beds on the first floor. 
Um, we ended up with a total of 1,004 beds for floors two, three, and four. All the patients had to be COVID positive as our patient population. And then what we considered as low acuity could not be on more than three liters of oxygen. One of our other major challenges is that they needed to actually be ambulatory. Because we had so much oxygen flowing through the building, we were a fire hazard. Um, we did an analysis to look at the fire alarms in that building, and the majority of those fire alarms were related to burnt microwave popcorn. So it, our fire marshal said that if the alarm went off, we would have to evacuate all of the patients sitting in the building. So the, one of the first challenges that we did was we removed all the microwaves out of the health education campus. Uh, next slide. One of the things that I thought would be interesting was the challenging amount of staffing that we would have to provide um, taking care of those patients. And so technically it would have been one physician between taking care of a team of patients of between 20 and 25 patients with COVID. The nursing ratio, our nursing ratio is usually one to six patients. We had to elevate it to one to eight. And probably the hardest thing, because we had a shortage of respiratory therapists, would be a ratio of one to 50 patients. Uh, next slide. In addition, I thought it would be nice for all of you to know that what types of supplies we had in the building. We weren't going to be able to have any sort of telemetry available um, because of so many technical factors. Um, so these people, we would not be able to routinely check um, their, their um, oxygen level. It would have to be a portable oxygen level way to check. We did have all of our electronic medical records. So we, we did have workstations on wheels. We had a nursing call light system that worked on Wi-Fi that we built. Um, we were able to do blood glucose monitoring. Of course, you saw the beds. As well as imaging, we created um, a radiology suite that had ultrasound, a fluoroscopy arm, as well as the ability to do chest x-rays. Um, we did have a large discussion about whether or not we needed to embed CAT scans and then decided that we would just need to wheel patients across the street if they needed a CAT scan um, to our uh, main campus hospital. We had a full service lab and an ability to de um, deliver blood, um, as well as oxygen supplies and a full PIXIS machine to deliver all the medications that were needed. Uh, next slide. In addition, so we spent a lot of time thinking about how we would activate our floors and when we would actually open up the Surge Hospital or the Hope Hospital. So we decided that what we would do is once our COVID units were 75% occupied in our um, traditional hospitals and our COVID occupancy for our ICUs were at 75%, we would alert our executive leaders and begin to activate those first 327 beds. You saw those beds were actually set up, but we, in terms of training our caregivers to actually come in and work. Then we created specific triggers to open floors two, four, and three. And the reason we decided to open two and four ahead of three was really related to logistics of floor three had the mo many more smaller rooms and we wanted the ability to see across the units instead. So that's why floor three was chosen last. Again, patient safety in mind for all of these decisions. Next slide. And in terms of opening the floors, um, one of the things that we worked with continuous improvement was to look at once we opened, where we actually would place patients through and had a phased approach in addition to the approach I just showed you in the larger um, planning. Next slide. 
this is a very busy slide, but my point in, in, in reviewing this slide for you was to show how organized we were for each of the teams to new, like basically five days notice to activate what things physically needed to be done, which were, which is actually the bottom yellow. So we had everything set up from each of the work streams ready to go, but at five days notice, we um, had a list of things that each team was responsible to accomplish once we went to go ahead and uh, open up HOPE. Um, and really this was a key throughout the entire project was um, the amount of organization that we needed to keep people, one, motivated and two, um, organized against those three work streams. I think that's my last slide. And next slide. Yes, that's my last slide. So, and I think we'll be taking questions at the end. So I'll transition it back to Jim. Excellent. Well, thank you, Rita. I have to say, you know, I, I knew what you and your team did, but hearing about it now, I'm in awe. We have, you know, almost 250 people working here every day to bring our hospital to life. And the fact that you did that in a matter of weeks is just amazing. So, uh, um, but thank you. Um, um, and our final speaker, to, speaker today is Brian Rubin. Brian is Professor of Pathology, Director of Soft Tissue Pathology, and Chairman of the Robert J. Tomsick Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Institute at Cleveland Clinic. He has dedicated his career to a better understanding of the diagnosis and classification of soft tissue neoplasms, especially sarcomas, uh, where he's a prominent figure nationally and internationally. Dr. Rubin has most recently led his team in the Path and Lab Medicine Institute in launching, expanding, and maintaining COVID testing during the pandemic. And today he's going to tell us a bit more about these efforts as well as COVID testing in general. Brian? Thanks very much for that introduction, Jim, and it's a pleasure to be um, with everybody this evening. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. I kept my slides pretty brief, um, so hopefully that um, will work for us this afternoon. So um, I just, I, I first, I just thought I would list the, the accomplishments that we had, just sort of, and it's it's a little bit like Rita's timeline. I was reliving Rita's timeline and getting tired as she was presenting it because this has been an unbelievable lift for us in everywhere in the world, but uh, especially here in Cleveland, and that we didn't have any inkling that we'd be dealing with COVID. And we made our budgets and put things together last, you know, fall or the fall of, of 19, and then 20 was a big surprise for us. So um, the first thing we did was we launched, as she said, COVID came upon us suddenly, and we got the order from the C-suite to launch COVID testing because the CDC had been taking it on, but um, they actually were unable. They, they they overestimated their capacity to do it, and then they backtracked and said, all right, all labs can open COVID testing. Uh, we went from ground zero to actually active testing in 10 days. We uh, fired up the laboratory. We asked people this. I mean, molecular microbiology is one of the sleepiest labs you would have in the hospital typically. It's an eight to five, kind of five day a week operation. We immediately went to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We found people within the lab that weren't doing anything because we shut down our hospital essentially to, to um, elective surgeries. And we launched this big dedicated lab for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Um, again, we sh staffed it for three shifts a day, seven days a week. And ever since March 10th or March 12th, when we launched, we've been in operation. We've never stopped. We currently have six different testing platforms. So for those of you who are interested in supply chain issues, supply chain, which I knew very little about before COVID, has become our partner because we've had to monopolize what is an excellent supply chain at the Cleveland Clinic to find different kinds of reagents, testing machinery, what have you, to do testing. And the only way we can keep our testing operational is by having a diversity of platforms. That's because at any one time we could get a note from one of our suppliers that they're not gonna give us reagents because they've been sent to the UK or that the government here in the United States has taken all the reagents or whatever it is. And so um, anyway, um, that's, so, you know, it's been, it's been a big problem, but, but by diversifying, we've, we've done a good job. Um, we, um, 
had at the time I actually made this slide 3,500 standard turnaround time tests. Since that time, actually, we've increased to 5,000. So we're now currently at 5,000 tests, and we are rapidly reaching that with we're using that capacity on a daily basis. Yesterday, we did over 4,000 tests, and today we're already at 2,500 tests, and it's you know one o'clock in the afternoon here. So we'll probably hit 5,000 today. Um, we've been really involved in communication and educating colleagues with seminars and webinars such as this. Um, many media presentations have been done, many academic publications. I mean, I've personally been on a variety of news shows and in various newspapers. Um, I was even interviewed with Dr. Tony Fauci, and we were, we had a whole layout together in, in um, I think it was USA Today. I sent it to my mom. She was really very happy to see me being quoted alongside such a giant like Tony Fauci. Um, and um, we've taken on swabbing. So typically swabbing is done by nursing. Nursing was overwhelmed with the um, initially took it on. And then we took it from nursing because they got overwhelmed. They had to go back and take care of patients. And so we actually now staff and take care of swabbing as well. We have instituted something called observe self swabbing um, as an innovation. And we had a very ambitious plan for cold and flu season to expand our capacity to 5,400 tests today by November 1st. You'll notice it's November 12th. So we reached that capacity and we have opened up. And um, this was really all done through a partnership with HR, supply chain, facilities, operations. I mean, there's just numerous people that came together. We just kind of talked about this, but I have to emphasize that everybody in the clinic came together around this common purpose of mounting a response to COVID. And um, my job was to um, take care of COVID testing. Next slide. So just to show you what one of the tests looked like, this is a, actually a, one of our more manual assays. This is a CDC assay, which is now morphed into something called a Thermo Fisher assay. But on the left side, you have something called a, um, a, a nucleic acid extractor. We do all nucleic acid-based testing at the Cleveland Clinic, and that's because we want the highest sensitivity and specificity testing available. And we have the resources to do it. Not everybody can have nucleic acid-based testing the way we do. In the middle, you can see the reagents, they come in vials. And then on the right side is a PCR machine. That's a, that's a way of amplifying the nucleic acids so that we can see a signal. And uh, COVID is an RNA virus. So basically we isolate the RNA, amplify it with the uh, reagents in the middle there, and we can detect it because we use fluorescently labeled primers and we can see when somebody has COVID in their sample. Next slide. And this is a fully automated assay, this thing that looks like a refrigerator. We get these cartridges, we pipe it in a little bit of the transport media from the nasal swab into that cartridge and then just pop it into that device. The device does all the work. And ideally, we would love to have enough of this kind of testing to run all of our testing at the Cleveland Clinic because it would have a low manpower FTE ask. However, these cartridges were an absolute premium. Um, everybody in the United States is allocated to different kinds of cartridges. This is the Cepheid, which is the the king of all these devices. It's the most sensitive and most accurate, and it's relatively fast on top of everything else. But we get a small allocation. We get about 300 of these cartridges a day, and we have to use them very strategically within our massive hospital system here in Northeast Ohio. Next slide. So when I took this slide, um, a couple of nights ago, actually, I, had to, I forgot to update the, the top of it, but we, we had done over 419,000 tests. We're at something like 440 today. Um, so we're just rapidly kind of moving up. We had a 6% overall positivity rate. Next slide. And here's what the pandemic looks like from a testing and capacity standpoint. So if you look at the top frame here, the yellow line, that yellow line is our capacity for testing, which has gone up over time. We started with a really relatively humble couple hundred tests. And when I took this picture, we'd uh, done the most in any one day was 3,500 tests. We eclipsed that yesterday with about 4,300 tests. And you can see that little blue kind of wave beneath it is actually the number of positives each day. So our record number of positives was 539. Again, we beat that yesterday with something like 700 positive tests. And then if you look at the green graph below, that's the percentage of COVID positive tests all comers within the Cleveland Clinic. So it's asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. But you can see really clearly the three distinct waves that we are experiencing or have experienced with wave number one being on the far left, that smaller sort of summer wave there in the middle that occurred with a peak around mid-July. And then on the far right side, you can see 
what we're currently experiencing, which is wave number three, and it's already passed for the first two waves. And we don't know when it's going to stop, but modeling has us pretty scared. We expect to see a lot of positive patients here over the next few months, and we're going to have to adapt. And, you know, it just kind of brings up another point that Ian sort of brought up when he gave his talk and that things change on a daily basis. I've never been involved in anything as dynamic as COVID. And we react each day and it's a testament to the teamwork, to the dedication, to the flexibility, to the smarts, the depth. I mean, all aspects of what we do. And I'm sure it's the same in every aspect of, of virtually every hospital, but it's especially true at the clinic to be able to adapt and react and take care of our patients. It's a, it's a challenge every day I get out of bed and I know I'm gonna get a bunch of stuff thrown at me that day that I didn't expect when I woke up and my job is to handle them in a calm and efficient manner and try to do the best I can to do that. Next slide. So as part of our response, one of our six platforms is a platform we developed ourselves. So we have our own um, emergency use authorization from the FDA for the Cleveland Clinic platform. That's one we use for our, our pre-op and pre-surgical patients. Um, that just shows the assay that was approved on uh, August 3rd. Next slide. Uh, we also innovated something called um, a self-check COVID testing kit. And so one of the one of our goals was to keep our patients who are relatively healthy and not really symptomatic that we needed to test for procedures and so forth out of the hospital. So we developed an at-home testing kit, and this would be the instruction for that. So basically patients would pick these kits up at the pharmacy, take them home or to their cars, wherever is convenient, test themselves, they would swab themselves and then put their swab back in the vial and then drop it into a drop box, which is strategically located at many different pharmacies and within our laboratories. We actually are still waiting for the FDA to approve this kit. The FDA has slowed down significantly because they have so many requests, but we did get a response back um, about a week and a half ago that was very favorable and we're just sort of ironing out the details and we expect approval any day now. We can't wait to get that going because it'll give us a a additional swabbing capacity that we don't currently have. It'll, it'll allow us to swab an additional thousand patients a day, essentially by the patients doing them themselves. There we go. And then this is just the instructions again in kind of detail. And you can see we, sort of A to Z, you get your label, you get your different components of the kit, then you know to wash your hands, stick the swab in your nose, rotate it, go to, go to do the other nostril, then put it back, um, driving it back. It's, it's a very detailed set of instructions. We actually had to test this with a patient population to make sure they could do it. Next slide. And this is just a look at what our, growing our testing capacity over the last few months. Um, so you can see the, the, the left side over there is in September, and you can see our testing capacity that day was about 2,500 tests, sort of the gear that started piling up. We actually hired 150 people to do this testing. That included about 50 people to swab, about 50 people to transport the swabs once they were brought around, and then 50 people to actually do the technical aspects of testing. And so at the top, you can see um, all the hiring that went on. This was a big project with HR. Everybody said, you can't do it, Brian. You're not going to get your people. But in fact, we did it. Actually, we've, we've hired over 90% of the people that we need. Um, but once you hire them, then you have to train them, bring them online. It's really a big deal. You can see down below, we had to buy a lot of extra machinery. When all that machinery came in, there's various thermocyclers, robotic liquid handlers, uh, nucleic acid extractors, et cetera. Um, and then you can see the capacity ramping up to where we currently are at about 5,000 tests a day. Another thing we did was we actually built flu testing into our COVID testing. So we created a four-in-one test that tested for flu, RSV, that's respiratory syncytial virus, so flu A and B, respiratory syncytial virus, and COVID all in the same test. And that's because we wanted to be prepared for flu season. Ironically, Flu has been affected way better than COVID when it comes to social distancing and some of the things that we've done. And we haven't seen flu season yet. In fact, down in Australia in the Southern Hemisphere, flu season basically didn't happen this year. It's really fascinating. And I think there'll be a lot of cool kind of postscript written about that afterwards. I do think we'll see some flu this year. We're ready for it when we have it, but we couldn't not be ready for flu season. So we are, we can test for flu any anytime we want, and we have a really big capacity. We can do 3,000 flu slash COVID slash RV, RSV tests every single day. Next slide. Now, this is, um, I think, my last slide, and I just wanted to, to, to mention this because it comes up a lot. So antigen and antibody testing, there's three major modalities to test um, for COVID. One would be nucleic acid testing. That's the stuff I've been talking about up to this point. A second would be antigen testing. Ian mentioned that very briefly with your sort of um, pregnancy type testing. 
and then antibody testing or serology, and that's really done to look at whether patients have been infected in the past. It's not useful for looking at a current infection because it takes a while to mount an antibody response. Now, we've not used to any antigen testing of any type. Um, that's because it has a lower specificity than nucleic acid testing. And false positives are a major problem. So you, meant, you heard Ian mention that we're gonna, you're going to be screening, essentially, all of your caregivers with an, uh, an antigen testing platform, but they need to be confirmed by nucleic acid-based testing. And so you have to think of antigen testing as a screen. It's not that definitive of a test, and that's just a subtlety of testing that many people don't understand. In fact, many people who are launching testing programs don't really understand that. And that's where the false positives and bad press would come around something like antigen testing. However, I believe in antigen testing. I think it has a use. It sounds like you're using it very appropriately there in the UK. And so, um, we just don't need it for what we're doing because we're testing a group that's coming into the hospital each day. We have enough nucleic acid-based testing that we don't need to screen essentially with antigen testing. Should we need it in the future, we're ready to bring it on. We've looked at several platforms and it will be available to us. We also haven't done any antib antibody testing or serology because we, it's not useful in the management of individual patients. And that's what we're in the business of doing here at the Cleveland Clinic. We're not an epidemiology group. Antibody testing is really useful in the epidemiology setting when you wanna know what's happening with populations of people. But for individual patients, in fact, it's not that reliable. It doesn't provide any information that's useful because we don't know what to do with the information anyway. You talk to Ian, but I'm sure he will support me when I say that. Just because somebody's got antibodies doesn't mean that they're gonna be immune. We don't know the correlates of immunity. The science needs to come along before we have a really full understanding about, about what, um, what antibodies mean. And so for those reasons, we don't use antigen or antibody testing. However, we have evaluated all these platforms. We'd be ready to launch them at any time should they be useful for us. We just don't currently use them. And I think that was my last slide. All right, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure the rest of the group is happy to answer questions um, as well. Excellent, thank you, Brian. Um, so impressive again, what you and your team were able to do. And I guess that's another potential ray of hope that perhaps one side effect of everybody wearing their masks and distancing and washing their hands is we might have a milder flu season this year. Uh, I think that would really be welcome here uh, in the UK as well as the US. Um, well, we, we have time for just a few questions. Uh, I want to thank our panelists. Um, one that's come in, and I think maybe um, I'll direct that first to Rita and then to Ian, um, would be um, something that's on a lot of people's minds with the positive news about a vaccine uh, this week. Uh, we know that countries are ramping up to get that vaccine out to people. So I really wanted to ask first Rita and then Ian how you see um, logistically um, the process going to actually get that vaccine out in the U.S. for Rita and then uh, Ian in the U.K. Uh, thanks, Jim. So I know we're working with our governor in terms of trying to understand how many vaccines will be made available to us. Um, so first, I'll just answer the question um, related to the Cleveland Clinic and our healthcare workers who would be in that tier one um, group that would need to be vaccinated. Um, depending, we do have all the freezers that are needed to store. One of the other things is Dr. Wiley, who's uh, the chief medical officer, is he's actually helping lead that team around vaccination. Um, our CEO has specifically said that we would make sure that everyone is safe to be vaccinated. Um, and one of the options that they're actually looking for is a drive through versus actually dispensing the vaccines, um, normally how we would do the flu station vaccines. Um, and so the second part is how we can also help our community and working with the city of um, Cleveland Public Health as well as the board. I think Red might be having some technical difficulties. I'm sorry, maybe we'll come back to that, but maybe um, Ian, how about in the UK? How do you see it unfolding? Uh, we have much more central control here from central government about what we can and can't do and how vaccines are supplied and how they're distributed. Uh, and also on, on kit, I was um, uh, really interested to hear how Brian's coping with, with the testing, for instance. And you said you had 300 uh, Kefid tests a day. We have 
25, 30 a day that we can use. Uh, so it's, it's, there's a big difference. Um, in terms of distributing the vaccine, uh, I think that's still to be worked through. It'll be an upscaling of our annual flu vaccination, I would assume. Um, there's talk of uh, hiring large halls and stadia, um, shopping malls, places like that, uh, and uh, asking our GPs to drop a certain amount of their normal work to vaccinate instead, to train other vaccinators, um, so from, from nursing and allied health professionals to be able to do it and to, uh, to bring other people out of retirement. But I think the government hopes that if it can, it could, if it can acquire enough vaccine um, that's approved by our regulatory authorities to be able to uh, vaccinate most of the population at risk sometime in the by the first uh, by by march or april next year but it's going to it's going to take a huge amount of resources over that length of time so it'll be interesting to see how it how it pans out excellent well thank you well unfortunately it looks like we've lost rita i think uh thank goodness we made it through the webinar without more technical challenges i know we're all used to that now but first of all i wanted to thank our panelists thank you guys for joining us uh, second of all, thank you, the audience. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll be um, getting the links out there so that in case anyone else that you know might want to view it, it'll be available to you. Uh, and since I'm sure there are other questions that you might want to get to our panelists, we'll also be communicating with all of you who attended, and certainly we, we would welcome questions, and I can help direct them to uh, whichever panelists would be the most appropriate one. Um, thank you, Lauren, um, for everything you did uh, behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, Ian, Brian, thank you very much, and, and have a good rest of your evening or rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.